Hello there, and welcome back to the channel. This is Nerd World History. Sorry for the slight absence recently. As you can tell, I am still doing a lot of work on my house. It's made my schedule a little sporadic. I am trying to get back on track. In today's episode, I am going to be looking at the kind of weapons, armor, and tactics, such as they were, employed by the Celts against each other and their enemies. Before we get started, please like, share, subscribe, comment down below and tell me what you'd like me to do a video on in this universe. In this universe? In history. Sorry, other channels bouncing into my head there. And also, this video is brought to you by my sponsor, Relentless Rebels, who are linked in the description below, but we'll get to them a little bit later in the video. With that out of the way, let's get started. All right, so you know what this video is about because you did click on the thumbnail. Now it is on your relatively quick video today. We're covering the different ways the Celts waged war and try and frame it in a little bit of perspective. So I'm not going to go into specific details of very specific battles because that can be covered in some of my videos regarding specific tribes and possibly detailing a chronicle of the Roman invasion, which I'm also considering. But anyway. Different Celts from different parts of Europe fought in different ways, but overall there were certain things that made them sort of universal. This was determined through culture, uh, artistic form, and basically a shared, well, culture. Similar to the Greeks, who had things like hoplite formations and other things, the Celts had their own formations, their own ways of waging war. They were just different to how others did it, it was more fluid. The Celts were not so big on entrenched defences, and that's not to say that they didn't have them. For example, Paris was well known to be very well fortified. It was so well fortified, in fact, Julius Caesar couldn't actively break its defences. There are also other settlements in more eastern parts of Europe that were known to also be fairly well fortified, but then he's starting to get closer to, like, Etruscan or Greek culture where they may have had a little more influence. So more broadly in Celtic culture they were more about going out and challenging the enemy than maybe stopping them. As I've mentioned in other videos, a hill fort is a misnomer. It's it's not necessarily a fort. Some of them were for show. Some of them didn't have defences all the way around and some of them didn't even have walls on top of the actual earthen banks. These were sometimes as much about status as they were about anything else. It's a bit like having nowadays having um, a flashy driveway up to your big house and a nice clean wall and bushes. These wouldn't really deter an invader but they do make it look good. Now it's the same sort of thing back then. It wasn't so much all the time about stopping an army. After all you're not in an age where warfare is a constant issue so maybe a threat but not a constant everyday problem. Again, you might rely more on warriors going out to intercept a force than anything else, but certain other fortifications, such as Maiden Castle, as it's widely known, did have more impressive defences other than its ramparts. And the ramparts of Maiden Castle are bloody ex They're big. But anyway, there is evidence of walls, and in some forts' cases there were stone walls, but most of the time they were timber. But there also you have con obvious constructions of things like guard houses, places where you could have dugouts in the actual entrenchments for booby traps and there was evidence of spikes being stuck in and things of this nature. Now, getting away from defensive fortifications, the Celts in an individual fighting prowess were different to the Romans. Now it's often said the Roman army, because the, the Romans are the best comparison, because of all the cultures the Celts went up against, it was mainly the Romans. And <clears throat> it's not unfair to say that the Roman war machine was spectacular. They took the best bits of every other culture they had conquered. Uh, for example, their shield design, I, th I believe, was Spanish in you know, origins. It came from Hispania. Um, their swords were adopted from another culture. Their helmets, interestingly, were Celtic-inspired. The helmet of a Roman soldier was based on that of the helmet of a Gaul. So they took the best bits of the armor. They took Greek-style tactics, though, such as those of the hoplites, and they sort of molded it. And they took all these other different things and put them together. I've said before, the Romans are not much of a naval force, because they were all about the army. They were never good with naval warfare, like the Carthaginians were, or the Venetians and people like that, who were good with navies. The Romans are much more of a land army. Now, 
To compare them to the Celts isn't not is not unfair, because they were two contemporary forces that had a very different style of doing things. The Romans had just simply refined it, but the truth is the Roman war machine was vastly superior to anyone else's. People go on about the Egyptians and the Greeks and how fantastic they were, and they were. They were great cultures. But a Greek army was mostly non-professional, or semi-professional, led by a handful of citizens, usually. You had a handful of competent officers and soldiers, but generally speaking, these were not seasoned, everyday soldiers like the Romans were. The Romans, although certainly did not introduce the idea of professional warfare, they, they, they perfected it. The Egyptians, on the other hand, such as the armies I know of Ramesses the Great, who did a lot of expanding of his forces, and bear in mind that was relatively contemporary to the Celts, because it's wrong to think the Celts didn't just exist as the Romans were invading Gaul, Hispania, Germania, and Britannia. They had existed for centuries before that, and there was a long line of unbroken culture that stretched back possibly millennia, as there was something of a continuity of some cultural identity stretching further back, certainly a culture that was more older than the Roman. But like anything old, sometimes it gets a little stuck in its ways. Now the Egyptian army, as I said, one of the ways the soldiers got paid was they severed the right hand of every enemy combatant, and the more hands they brought back to their commanders, the more money they got, like mercenaries. It was to prove how many they had actually killed. Whether they killed them or not was probably irrelevant. They would often go looting the battlefield, not only for spoils of war, but also for more hands. This actually cost the Egyptians a few battles, because they couldn't press the advantage of a retreating enemy, allowing them to withdraw, regroup, or fortify, or dig in. The Romans got rid of all this. Soldiers had wages. It was a job. It wasn't just something they did on the side. Now to Celts it's hard to say whether or not there were truly professional soldiers. Semi-professional I think would be a more accurate description. They're often portrayed as being unsophisticated and unorganized. That's again not true. They were just different to the Romans. Not as good. I'm not going to pretend that they were good. They were different but the Roman way was better, clearly. It, it absolutely trashed them. But that wasn't to say that their method of warfare didn't work perfectly well against the Etruscan culture that preceded the Romans, against the Greeks, which they often fought against, as well as other contemporary armies they would have been perfectly balanced against. It was just the Romans were a, a leaps and bounds evolution of warfare beyond everybody else. <clears throat> One of the Celts' favourite tactics, obviously, was swarm attack. The Romans were all about close quarter fighting, lock their shields together, stick their, throw their their spear and then jab with the swords. Celts were much more individualistic. They'd swing their sword around. I don't, although I do actually collect weapons, weirdly I don't own any Celtic weapons at all, so I can't show you an example of one from my collection, but they had a own design of swords. Now a Roman sword, a gladius, is a short stabbing sword designed to jab through the shield wall and into the enemies, not so much with the slashing. A Celtic sword, although obviously has a pointy end like any sword does, it has a typical, one of the more typical designs was a sort of a leaf blade, which was again not the only design, different areas of the world and at different time periods used different designs, but for now we'll talk about that one. That was designed to slice the enemy, to bow, bow down on them, it had a slightly heavier end than this end, it was usually one handed. And it was a warrior's sword. They were designed to swing this thing around so you didn't want to be near them, you might take the head off your own ally. But it was designed to throw some weight down on the enemy, not just cut into them. Slashing as well as stabbing. A very different style of war. It was much more about individual prowess on the battlefield, which is why likely Celts did often paint their body. They were trying to stand out. They wanted to show how manly and vigorous they were. Although there were actually women Celtic warriors as well, so saying manly might not be their most accurate description, but generally speaking, that's what we're looking at. But that's not to say that they didn't have some level of organisation. There were a sort of horn, a sort of Celtic horn. These varied from obviously little just horns, which they would blow through, to the sort of more famous one, which is a sort of, sort of almost looks like a dragon. A few examples have been found in Britain, but I think they are more common in the continent. And they had a weird little wobbly tongue in them, and you'd blow into it. It made a very, very unearthly sound to it, a very unnatural sound, but this was sometimes used as a coordination point in the battlefield, because obviously you didn't have radios or any of that kind of communication, and with ill-disciplined warriors you had to have some way of trying to get the message out. Attack, withdraw, go to the left, go to the right, whatever. And this was a way of doing it, Now they wouldn't, they wouldn't always listen, because again, fairly 
ill-disciplined individualistic warriors, not always the same. Now there was a smaller core within the Celtic forces of more professional soldiers, but generally speaking, you're talking about almost reserves. Before I carry that on, just inter interrupt myself. Relentless Rebels, my sponsor of this video, they produce Viking style jewellery. Vikings are a closely linked culture to the Celts, so I think there's some kind of connection there. At least with this video, maybe. It's all history, it's all relative, it's all beautiful, as is much of their jewellery. <clears throat> now it's stainless steel, but they do a variety of very interesting jewellery styles of their own, as well as a variety which are Viking inspired. Thor's hammer, class, things of this nature which hopefully I've remembered to put something on the screen. Now, if you go to their website, which is linked in the description below, and use the promo code NERD20 at checkout, you'll get a 20% discount on anything that they sell, which are at least of a decent quality. Because honestly, I actually get people messaging me, mostly on Instagram, uh, looking for me to promote them. Oh, we're trying to expand into your country, this, that, and the other. And I just, there was one, again, not gonna mention who they were. I may have mentioned this before. And I had no idea who they were. I had to Google them, didn't like the sound of them. They had bad reviews and I thought I'm not putting my name to that. So these people, they've been decent. I had one issue with something um, taking forever to get here. They sent it out again because it had probably got lost in the mail. I've not had any real problems with them. And they seem to do good quality material. Nothing, I've, again, nothing's turned my skin green so far. And yeah. If that's a promotion, if that's something you can take on board, then by all means, I quite like them. It's why I allow them to be my sponsor, because I'm not just going to let anyone sponsor my videos, because again, it's my name on it. And that's all I got, really. And that said, back to the video. Now, most of these warriors would have, of course, been your farmers, your blacksmiths, your tanners, your shoemakers, whatever, being called up to help defend their territory, probably most of the time against other Celts. Because the evidence of large-scale warfare, although exists, it's mostly not something you see much of in the archaeological record in the pre-Roman times in Europe. Now, <clears throat> there was a smaller core of professionals to the army, and professionals, again, is probably a strong word, but best comparison is probably more likely to the Greeks, where you had a small number of citizens who were closer to the chieftain. These men and women would have been a bit more skilled. They'd have spent more of their time practicing, and particular things like chariots. The Celts were excellent at chariot warfare all across Celtic, the Celtic world, particularly in Britain, but it was actually something they were good at universally, even in the continent. And they used them to hop around the battlefield very quickly, strafe the enemy, and move, you know, rested soldiers to the front and pull back injured or tired soldiers who were fighting at the front. Now, because, as I said, many of the warriors who were fighting were not skilled professional soldiers who probably didn't spend a lot of time practicing with a sword, if they even had a sword, you had to have a way to organize them, and you always would have these men or women on the chariots who'd be blowing their horns and those things, sounding instructions. These, these basic commands would have been something you could have instilled in an army pretty quickly. Now again, against other ancient world powers, not the Romans, these tactics were perfectly viable, particularly against other Celts. They didn't require particularly big open battlefields, you could fight from jungles, guerrilla tactics. The Celts were not stupid, they understood that they were up against the Romans and they were a different style of enemy, but they were too slow to adapt their tactics in some ways. But you look at some of the other things, it's easy to dismiss because they were so easily, is again the wrong word, but they, let's use it, they were easily defeated by the Romans. It's easy to think that they weren't skilled warriors. They were, you think about, I don't know if any of you watching this have ever picked up a bow. I do some archery. A bow is not an easy thing to pull back. And holding it long enough to aim and hit and account for wind, temperature, the general shake of your hand, anything to make sure you're hitting your target, takes practice. A lot of it. Now, you could say maybe they were hunting. Maybe they were, but I can't imagine. You, you know, is every, does everyone hunt? I don't think so. Does your average teacher hunt? I can't see it. The ancient Celts, they didn't. They'd have to practice with these things. Now, one of the things you do find, particularly in Britain, uh, stores of slingshot, usually sort of egg-sized terracotta pieces, usually a fire, obviously fired clay that was shaped into a bullet-like shape. That knowledge that that is the best shape, again, takes practice. Now a sling, you can use a slingshot to hunt, 
But why would you have massive caches of them behind your fortified walls? What, are you waiting for deer to walk past? Again, evidence of military planning. You would have had men at arms, or women at arms, people at arms, generally, it probably would have been mostly men anyway, but still, time period. You would have had these people practicing this enough that they were accurate. I mean, seriously, a bow is bad enough. I, I've never tried to throw a sling, but I've seen it done, and I'd probably take out my own eye trying to do it. Again, it must have took a lot of practice. And there's evidence of them, these things could crack a Roman helmet, it's said. So, it takes practice. So to dismiss them as unskilled, undisciplined warriors is wrong. Were they as disciplined as the Romans? No. Was the Roman war machine better? Yes, of course it was. But were they necessarily bad? No. So, with all that in mind, let's look at your average Celtic warrior from across all of the Celtic world, the very bare bones that they would have had. The average Celt would not have worn armour, they wouldn't have worn a helmet, they probably didn't have a sword. But they would have had knives, they would have had probably a sling, a bow is a pretty safe bet. A spear or other farming implement would easily be reused as a weapon. Particularly things like scythes and your average you know, pitchfork. Now that's not to say a lot of them wouldn't have had swords. Now that's in a defensive manner. The Gauls that sacked Rome, they wouldn't have been attacking with pitchforks. They would have been attacked. They would have been the warriors. They would have had swords. Swords and other large military implements were pretty common. And they were fairly readily available, despite what you might think. So, axes and other things that would be normally tools. I mean, I own a couple of wood axes for cutting wood for, um, you know, burning. <clears throat> I also own a war axe. Now, in many ways, the war axe is actually not as... It's a bit less easy to wield. It's longer. It's heavier. And for someone of my build and size, as I'm only a... I'm not exactly muscular. And I'm not overly tall. I'm only 5'10". So... I just a normal wood axe, for me, is a lot easier to wield. It's also safer for everyone around me if I was going into battle with an axe to have something of that caliber. Now that said, I would probably receive some training from others in the unit of the whatever the Celts would have in the dividing their forces into. I would also be probably a little more proficient with it than what I am. But that said, hit someone in the face with that axe, or hit them in the face with the war axe, the result is going to be the same thing. Now that's your average. Now, th this this nonsense that Celts ran into battle naked, maybe a few did, but I'm sure there are plenty of soldiers who watch this and ask yourself, are you going up against an enemy sold enemy division naked? I, are you that dumb? I don't think you are. And I don't think they were either. We've got to remember that these people were people. Now, yes, some of them may have been off their tits on drugs, hallucinogenic mushrooms, things of that nature, you know, pretty widely consumed. But then again, so were the Greeks. The Spartans, fairly famous for their um, proficiency in war. They were off their tits on um, plenty of hallucinogens. It gave them bravery. It didn't give them stupidity. So, no, I, I, I believe, yes, some of them may have done, but a lot didn't. Shields as well. The next stage up. You're starting to get to probably people who are a bit more equipped. This is less defensive, more type of... You're starting to look at the army now. What there would be... From a modern context, the army. They probably still didn't have armour. They may have started to have a few of them who were wealthy enough to have got... Or may have inherited. Or stolen. Looted. Whatever. A helmet. Maybe a bit of light chain mail starts to come in around this around this level. Spears, things of that nature, are very, very readily available. Even the lowest ranks probably had the facility to get their hands on at least one spear you start to get more organized here maybe they've got a few there's a lot going to be a lot more swords available at this rank and file within the army again army is the wrong word and i know someone's going to point it out it isn't an army they, they didn't have an army in the modern context but i don't really have another way of contextualizing it these were warriors organized into a battle division or regiment force of some description let's just call it an army so this army would have been now made up of a lot more warriors who had access to better equipment particularly shields because shields were easy to make 
you know, the kids back home could have made it. Wicker shields backed by leather or just fabric, it's going to stop something. Again, it's better to have that than nothing. Close in fighting, it might not be too useful. Once it's got a few arrows in it, you throw it to one side. But it's also disposable. It's made with reeds and sticks that have been collected near to where you live. It's pretty easy to make, etc. By this point as well, again, you've got the, the, the guys with slings. You've got the guys with bows. You've got a few people maybe utilizing a few um, you know, more basic elements like fire, like burning arrows, things of that nature. They're not stupid. They're going to use whatever they've got. Now you get to the next level. And I know there are not many examples, particularly in Britain. There's very, very few. That's not to say they didn't have them. They're just not common. Or at least not many have survived or not many have been found. Helmets are almost one of the most elusive things you see. But it's logical to me. Your average greater warrior, particularly from the chieftain and his warrior elites, they're going to have armor. And how much chain mail, for example, was invented, at least in Western Europe, and introduced by the Celts. Now, if they didn't have a concept of organized warfare, they wouldn't have had chainmail. So then, at this topper echelon of warriors, you've got the wealthy, your knights, for lack of a better term, who are the personal guards, the enforcers, the bodyguards, whatever, of the chieftain, generally speaking. But they would also be the commanders and chiefs of his army. They'd be the ones responsible for keeping everyone else in line, the charioteers. They'd be the guys blowing the horns. They'd be the ones keeping everything in line as well as defending the chieftain, as well as fighting beside him when, the, you know, shit, it's the fan, basically. And I can't believe for one second they didn't have armour, because armour existed and was available. Plate armour, chainmail, helmets, wooden shields, long, broad swords. Now, that's, say, the Celts. Tartan, as well. Tartan is actually a, is a good reason for tartan. Tartan is not just a good material to keep you warm. It also has an interesting ability to um, absorb, you know, arrows. It's pretty thick and blow, blowing around in the wind like it does. You've got one shoulder right around you. It will actually, from the back, if you are mounted on horseback or riding along on a chariot, if an arrow hits it or a spear hits it, it collapses in. The tartan wraps around it and stops it hitting you. It's actually, bit, I've seen tests of this. The ancient samurai as well used it as well when they were on horseback. They are all ornamental and like elaborate dress and had big capes flowing in the wind, but those capes were not just decorative. They served a function. The arrows fired at them would be absorbed. The, the cape would absorb the kinetic hit. So your Celt wrapped in his in his tartan or in his cloth or whatever, his wool sheet, whatever he happened to be wearing, that's not just ornamental. That serves a function. Now imagine that on the battlefield. Now I've got to remember again, a lot of the descriptions of the Celts are remembered by the Romans, but looking at the archaeology, Chainmail. Lots of weapons. I mean, there are so many swords. These people had weapons to spur to the point where they could deliberately break them and throw them into, into lakes and rivers as sacrifices to the gods, probably. Now, if they were doing that, they've got them to spare. So there are plenty of weapons to go around. And there's probably good reason for it because they're constantly at war with one another. As well as the Romans later on. This would have also ramped up ranked it into higher gear. You can imagine Vercingetorix on the continent going, blacksmiths, yeah, 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 it's all well and good. You make, yeah, make me a new spoon, but I'd rather have a few extra daggers, you know? You know? Let's make daggers. Let's make swords. Let's make armor because the Romans are coming. So you're going to ramp things up into high gear for warfare, aren't you? Your culture is going to go into overdrive to defend itself. And there we have, as this video is dragging on, as I did actually intend this to be like a 10 minute video, I think of it 20 minutes now. Uh, there we have the sort of fundamentals. As I said, I'm not going into every individual battle because obviously different periods in time, different wars, different conflicts, it would have been very different. But generally speaking, <clears throat> I find it dismissive to say that these people were primitive and didn't use tactics. They couldn't organize. The Romans lost entire legions to the Celts. I mean, I, I may actually have to do a video on this, but look what happened in Germany. They had to pull out. They lost two entire legions, never to be recreated, entirely wiped out. Now, some of that was because of Roman training of, you know, enemies who, who were mercenaries for them, who switched sides. But it was still, that was the leaders, the, the men fighting the guerrilla war. They wiped out two entire Roman divisions, and that was no small feat. And those were Celts. 
So to dismiss these people as stupid or foolish, running into battle naked, is just idiotic. Anyway, with all that said, if you made it all the way to this video, thank you for watching. Please check out my other channels that are linked in the description below, possibly linked on the screen. They're probably not, because I will forget to do that. Uh, they are definitely linked on the end screen, though, if you wait for that to come up. And again, you made it all the way to the video. Thank you for watching, and bye-bye.